Thank you. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that the Spirit of the Lord will speak to our hearts today, that you'll make your words come to life for us. God, that as you walk us through the Scriptures, the words will be powerful. They will touch our hearts. They will expose our needs, and they will meet those needs with grace and power in the name of Jesus Christ. And for this we give thanks. Amen. Healthy things grow. Do you believe that? Seems to be the way that God... Healthy things grow. Do you believe that? Seems to be the way. No. You say it again, does it work? <laughs> Healthy things grow. We began our lives as infants, you and I. Unknowing, needy, curious, daring, resilient, and growing. As if to underscore that this was by design, when God sent His Son, Jesus did not arrive as a mature man, but as an infant, unknowing, needy, curious, daring, resilient, and growing. The Scripture says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And all of this defines our own relationship with Christ. Not only did our human experience begin with infancy, but our life in the Spirit also begins with a new birth. It's not accidental that God chose that illustration for what He's doing in our lives. Whether you're a child or a young adult or a mature adult, when you're born of the Spirit, we all begin the same way in that moment, finding Christ and receiving life in the Spirit, we are still unknowing, needy, curious, daring, resilient, and growing. While as an adult you may have better access to intellectual understanding of what you read in the Scriptures, your experience level still begins at ground zero. And even a child may grasp the necessary truths of the Bible to begin this journey, because God has made it accessible to us all. And this means that there is much that we do not know from day one, and at day 1,000, and at day 10,000. There is still so much we do not know, for our God is immense. We don't have words to explain or express how expansive, how glorious, how majestic He is. But He created all things by the words of His mouth, by the intention of His heart. And there is nothing that exists that He did not make. So there is much that we don't know, even if we can understand the words that we read. And this means that we all need help to learn and develop our faith and obedience. This means that curiosity can be your friend if it leads you to explore the unfamiliar things of God. This means that a certain amount of daring is actually required to risk yourself on faith. This means that your resilience, your readiness to get back up and start again, will be tested repeatedly. It is a necessary part of your equipment. And this means that we all have room for and need of growth. We have not yet arrived. As Paul explained, Philippians chapter 3, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have attained this. Instead, I am single-minded, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching out for the things that are ahead. With this goal in mind, I strive toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We are not yet complete. and We all need to change. Healthy things grow, 
growing things change. As precious and endearing as infants can be, no parents wants them to remain infants. We anticipate their growth. She gained an ounce last week. He's already up to 22 inches. We celebrate their birthdays, their awards, their first job, their graduations, their moving out of the house. We expect change in the lives of our children, but change doesn't always flow in the direction that we had hoped for. There are around us adverse pressures and cultural currents that threaten to run us aground or bury us. To the Ephesians in chapter 4, Paul wrote these words, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. I look forward to that day, don't you? Because some people seek to take advantage of us, assuming an air of superiority and muscling their way into our lives. And such currents must be met with courage and fortitude and support for one another if we're to overcome and continue in the faith. Healthy things grow, growing things change, and change brings challenge. We are all more or less creatures of habit. When we find a taste that we enjoy, well, we just like to enjoy it often. Thank you very much. And when we find a place that we enjoy, we like to return to it as often as we can. When we find a church that we enjoy, we like to just have it stay the same indefinitely. And the inevitable changes brought about by people and time, even the good changes, threaten our comfort. Change upsets the status quo. Change makes us nervous. Change diminishes our sense of control. Paul admonished the Corinthian believers, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready, for you're still controlled by your sinful nature. These are words he wrote to a church, to Christian believers. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. So change challenges us to trust God again in new ways, just when we thought we had arrived. Healthy things grow, growing things change, change brings challenge, and challenge calls us to trust in God. Don't rely on your own wit. Turn to God for help. Call out to him. Ask others to pray with you. Our God. David said, we are powerless. We don't know what we should do. We look to you for help. Oh, that should be our motto. Because we often don't know what to do. But we forget to look to him for help. You see, this reliance is not a shame to you. Oh, you have to look to God. You have to ask God. That's not a shame to us. It's a blessing that God is available, that God has wisdom, that God wants to help us, that he has power to give us. God and other people want to help you. Caught in a battle for their lives between the Arameans on one side and the Ammonites on the other, General Joab said to his brother, If the Arameans are too strong for me, then come over and help me. And if the Ammonites are too strong for you, I'll help you. 
That's the way it works in a family. And that's what the church is supposed to be, God's family. God has pledged through Isaiah the prophet, I have chosen you and will not throw you away. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. For I know what I plan for you, says the Lord. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I have plans to give you a future filled with hope. When you call out to me and come to me in prayer, I will hear your prayers. When you seek me in prayer and worship, you will find me available to you. If you seek me with all your heart and soul, I will make myself available to you, says the Lord. What powerful words are these? God promises to hear, and he promises to answer, and he promises to help. What more can you ask? It's foolish to say, there is no help for me in God. So don't be a fool. Healthy things grow, growing things change, change brings challenge, challenge calls us to trust in God, and trusting in God breeds obedience. A wise man of Proverbs wrote these words, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will make your paths straight. You know, we each have a certain understanding, a perspective that motivates and guides us. Perhaps it's gained from experience or perhaps from education. But when the Bible refers to understanding, it's not talking about your intellect. Most of the time, it's talking about understanding God, His will and His way, however that comes to you. Do you understand what He wants? Do you understand how he wants to do it? Your understanding and his understanding may be light years apart. Indeed, he said, my plans are not like your plans, and my deeds are not like your deeds. For just as the sky is higher than the earth, so my deeds are superior to your deeds, and my plans superior to your plans. Can you show us that? That's not it. There it is. Thank you. All right. His plans are not ours. Our plans are not his, not to begin with. And so the task before us is how do we merge our plans with his? That is, how do we bring our plans under his? How do we surrender to his plan and his way of working in our lives? Because our way of working usually has to do with human power. Our way of working usually has to do with human control. How can I control you? How can I make you like me? How can I make you do what I want you to do? God's way is different. It's all about how can I show myself to you and bring you under my grace? and my strength. And it doesn't look like our way very often. Knowing this reality leads us to obey the Lord. He's wiser than we are, he's greater than we are, and he's worthy of our obedient embrace. Oh God, your will be done. In 1972, Elvis Presley sang these words written by Gene McClellan. Put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself and you will look at others differently. Put your hand in the hand of the man 
from Galilee. Uh -huh. That is for Gene McClellan, not for me. <laughs> it is not obedience to arbitrary rules that God's after. The obedience that God wants is from the heart to the leading of the Spirit of Christ. Are you obedient to His promptings? Are you obedient to His gentle nudge? Can you hear the whisper of His voice? Are you willing to stop what you're doing in order to take up what He wants? It's the obedience of your relationship with Him. It's the obedience that comes because you love Him and you count Him worthy and wise. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Obey your human bosses with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not like those who do their work only when someone is watching as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Obey with enthusiasm as though serving the Lord and not people. As though serving the Lord. That doesn't mean to pretend to obey. It means to obey enthusiastically the way you would if Jesus himself asked you to do something for him. It means trusting that God is working through the people and the circumstances in your life so that your service to others is also, in fact, service to Jesus Christ. Well, this caused Paul to proclaim, either your master is sin or your master is obedience. Let's stop and think about that for a moment. Either your master is sin or your master is obedience. Letting sin be your master, he said, leads to death. Letting obedience be your master leads to God's approval. You were slaves to sin. Thank God that you have become wholeheartedly obedient to the teachings which you were given. Healthy things grow, growing things change, change brings challenge, challenge calls us to trust in God, trusting in God breeds obedience, and obedience makes us healthy. Spiritual health is nothing other than a trustfully obedient relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And just like your physical health, it's constantly subject to change and in need of your attentive care. Though Jesus was God's Son, He learned trusting obedience by what He suffered, just as we do. Whoa, take a moment and read that with me. Though Jesus was God's Son, He learned trusting obedience by what He suffered, just as we do. And even with that, your care alone will never be enough. We need each other's help to live faithfully before the Lord. I want to show you a passage from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. The text is pretty small. I don't know if you can read it from where you sit or not. At my age, I couldn't but I, I have it here in larger print. <laughs> it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the measure of the fullness of Christ. Then, then, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We are not in Kansas anymore, people. Everywhere you turn, someone is attempting a scam. 
false emails asking for financial help, fake news promoting the latest conspiracy theory, pop-up warnings on your screen that your device has been infected, but we will help you right now. Threatening phone calls allegedly from AT&T or the IRS or PG&E. The constant flurry of such deceptions is frustrating, aggravating, and sometimes costly. Is it any wonder that people find it difficult to trust? How then are we to grow with Christ? Because we must trust if we're to grow. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Not just unlikely, it's impossible. The problems of immaturity and the dangers of aggressive deceitfulness are safeguarded by godly church leadership. That's what this passage begins with. Church leadership whose calling and responsibility it is to prepare God's people for their works of service. The whole aim of a life centered around the local church is so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. That's what God is doing. It's not just about a having a good time. It's not about a bless me club. It's about helping one another to know Christ and follow him closely. It's about telling others about him so that they might be awakened in faith and join the tribe. This is why we do church. This is why we come to church. This is why we serve in church so we can become the church that goes everywhere in Jesus' name. It's not just about going to the foreign fields. It's not just about going to unreached people groups. All good. It's about wherever you go, every day of every week, in your household, at your job, filling your gas tank, buying groceries, Wherever you go, Christ wants to go with you. The Spirit wants to move through you. He'll work in you through those people and circumstances you encounter, and He'll work through you to them. I particularly love the last line of this passage. It says, bring it up again for me. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now, the human body, as you know, is composed of many members, both internally and externally. And so also is the body of Christ, the church. And each part or member, whether seen or unseen, is vital to the project of life. Moreover, each connection between the body parts, the joints and ligament, is vital to the function of the whole. The connection creates the function. Joints and ligaments, those are not singular parts. Those are the intersection of parts. That's where you intersect with your wife. That's where you intersect with your sister in the Lord. That's where you intersect with another family in the church. That's where you intersect with the children in your class. That's where you intersect with one another. That is where the function occurs. That's where the life of the church unfolds. Now, if the body grows and builds itself up in love, then it can't be done alone because love requires two or more. Would you agree? I know there's a lot of talk today about loving ourselves, but if you put that in a vacuum, that's an ugly monster. If you're going to love yourself, be sure it's so that you can love others in the same way and to the same measure or more. So love requires two or more. Each part does its work 
to serve the other parts in love. Look at this passage from Galatians chapter 5. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge your flesh, but through love serve one another. Now here's the sum of what we learned today. Say it aloud with me, and we're going to walk through these line by line. First line, please. Healthy things grow. Growing things change. Change brings challenge. Challenge calls us to trust in God. Trusting in God breeds obedience. Obedience makes us healthy. And healthy things grow and growing things change, and so on, and so on, and so on. As you look over this cycle of life, this pattern of spiritual development, which element is most unsettling for you? Which has been most difficult for you to manage? And where do you think you're growing it? I want us to pray about these very things as we conclude today. And as we do, I'm going to ask you if you are willing to recommit yourself to this process. Health, growth, change, challenge, trusting, obeying. If you've been knocked off the wagon at some point, will you choose today with God's help to get back on and proceed from here? It, it's not about going back to the beginning and starting over. It's not about going back to the beginning and repairing all the mess, all the damage. Remember what Paul said? At some point, you have to put it in God's hands and forget those things which are behind and instead reach toward the things that lie ahead and press toward the mark for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what I'm inviting you to do today, to recommit yourself to the process. If necessary, get back on the wagon and proceed from here, trusting God for His mercy, His grace, and the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're ready for that, would you stand to your feet as we conclude today in prayer? I'm so grateful to you, Father, that you've designed for us an organic cycle of life. And that your grace is more than enough to cover all of our failures, all of our faltering, all of our mistakes, all of our misunderstandings, every way in which we can blow it. Your grace is sufficient. Your love never diminishes. Lord, I pray that you will help each of us to follow this pattern with you. I pray that you will help each of us in whatever area we need your help. Where is that cutting edge for me, for my friends? Holy Spirit, point it out to us. Tell us where it is you want to work in our lives today, this week. Those of us who are standing right now are saying, God, we recommit ourselves to growth, to health in the Spirit, to your way of life. And we pray for the power of your presence. We pray for the truth of the Scriptures. We pray for the power of Jesus' name over us and in us and through us to lead us in this cycle of life. 
God, may we grow from faith to faith and glory to glory, from health to growth to change to challenge to trust and obedience, and back to health again. God, keep us in your heart, keep us in your hands. We offer ourselves to you, and we pray that especially at this time of year, we will see how you are working in our life and through our lives to make these things so. And it's in Jesus' name that we give you our hearty thanks. Amen and amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Isn't God good? He is good. I mean, He's good. He's not bad. He's not evil. He's not conniving. I don't know. Sit down for a moment, and then I'll have you stand once again, and we'll go. But I just have to, it's exercise, you know? It's like Holy Ghost calisthenics. That's what we're doing here. But I was thinking today about uh, I was reading something that reminded me about the systems of the gods of the Romans and the Greeks, which were strong. It, probably some of you have read Greek mythology or, or read the Roman mythology, and you're familiar with some of that. All of those gods were actually made in the image of men because they had the same pernicious and sinister characteristics that we do at our worst. I mean, sometimes they were nice if you appeased them properly and if they felt like it. But other times they were like in antipathy with humans, battling them, destroying them, making a mockery of them. The God we encounter in the Bible is nothing like that. He doesn't change on a whim. He's not capricious. He's steady like a rock. He's good. He's not just good when he feels like it. He's not just good on a good day. He's not just good when you're good. He's good all the time. All the time he's good. And that's why he can call us and require us to trust him. Because he's not like the gods that men make for themselves. He's the God who made us. And he's the God who gives us the everlasting life. Let's trust him. Let's praise him. He is worthy of it all. Amen? All right, on your feet once more. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and protect you, holding you tight in His strong, loving arms. God smile upon you because your every act of faith, your every song of praise delights His heart. May God be gracious to you because your weaknesses your falterings, your failings are not enough to be cast from his presence. He loves you. May God be gracious to you and show you his favor in all your endeavors in this life and grant you his peace in heart and mind through Jesus our Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you, God. Go with the Lord and love one another.